And thanks to Care, Grace, uh, May, who is in Japan, so sort of excuse for not being here, uh, and all the other students involved, Victoria, uh, all of you folks who are involved at Care for working on campus on these things and for hosting this. I feel like because of this building, I should be giving a lecture on chemical engineering, but I don't know anything about it, so if you're here for that, you are in the wrong place. Um, let me get started by taking a little trip back and see if this works. A lot's changed in the last 40 years since the 1970s. We no longer smoke on planes. We've learned how to turn a computer from this into something that fits in our pocket. And perhaps most importantly, we've made some serious fashion changes. This is something we no longer allow in our society. But despite all those changes, something at the University of Washington has remained the same for the last 40 years. At UW, they are using live animals to teach paramedic students and flight nurses. Before pigs, they may have used dogs in the late 70s, but for most of that time, they've been using pigs. And we're going to get to why UW thinks this is important. We're going to pick apart the arguments. But in order to really understand how severe it is that UW has not changed its ways, it's important to see just how far we've come in the last 40 years when it comes to medical training. And there's no better example of that than what's happened with medical student training. I'm going to show you an image, and I'm sorry that you're eating. It's a little difficult to look at, but it's important. 30 years ago, this was the norm in medical school in the United States. Students would walk into a room, and there'd be an anesthetized dog on the table. They'd perform minor surgical procedures or inject the dog with drugs to see how it would respond physiologically. At the end of the lab, the dogs were all killed. Now, I'm happy that I work for an organization that saw a need to change this. The Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine has been around since 1985. And now we have 12,000 physician members and 150,000 members nationwide. In fact, we have 30,000 supporters alone in Washington State. And one of our founding goals was to replace the use of animals in medical student training, not just because it was ethically objectionable, but also because it was educationally inferior. And over time, we had a lot of success, but it didn't start easy. Now and then, we would write to schools. And sometimes we get responses like this. This was from the University of California, Irvine. The dean wrote us to say that after receiving our letter, he summarily informed faculty that they had to end the dog lab. A lot of times it didn't go that easily. We would have to take out ads like this one featuring a much younger Bill Maher. <laughs> or we would sometimes put up billboards like this one. In fact, this school, like some others, after we put up this billboard, switched from dogs to pigs, thinking the public wouldn't care as much. But we cared, because whatever the species, there are educational and ethical problems with that animal use. And over time, for medical student training in this country, we saw some really drastic change. As of the start of 2016, just 1% of US medical schools were using animals to teach students. And that brought us to May of 2016. There were just two final holdouts. Johns Hopkins University and the University of Tennessee College of Medicine campus in Chattanooga. Strange bedfellows, but partners in crime as of May of this year. And May is when Johns Hopkins announced that it was ending its animal lab after years of pressure from us and pressure from state legislators. We informed the president of the University of Tennessee that its school was now the last one using animals to teach medical students, and it decided, well, we don't want to be the last one doing this, so they stopped too. As of June this year, there was not a single US medical school for the first time in 30 years using animals to teach future physicians. And, and in order to really understand how far we've come, let's take another step back to 1995. Because that's when the University of Nevada felt so strongly about its dog lab for medical student training that it issued a public memo. The memo said that the faculty of the University of Nevada find it inconceivable that you could teach medical students without living mammals. Inconceivable is the word it used. But the same year that the University of Nevada was having trouble imagining a curriculum without animals, Harvard Medical School was replacing its dog lab with computer simulations. And this just goes to show you that while some programs are firmly rooted in the past and tradition, not willing to really see the future and how things are going to change. Others, in this case Harvard, modernize and revolutionize their curricula. And that really brings us to tonight's topic, which is paramedic training and what's happening here at UW. 
a couple years ago, we have a physician member who used to live in Seattle, now lives out in the East, but he was on faculty at Harborview Medical Center, and he said to us, hey, I see that you guys have made a lot of progress in medical student training. Did you know that UW and Harborview use animals to teach paramedics? And I've been doing this at this point for eight years, and I was floored because we hadn't seen an, a single paramedic program in that entire time that was using animals. But in order to really get a better understanding of what other programs were doing, we decided we should survey certain areas. Everything highlighted on this map from Texas to Washington State, we surveyed. And we found out that there are a lot of paramedic programs not using live animals to teach trainees. In fact, none of these use animals, <coughs> none of those, none of these, and none of those either. That's 120 programs from Texas to Washington not using animals to teach paramedics. Yet UW does something a little different. I forget the next slide. Let me highlight a few programs that, I, that were on that list of 120, and a few that were not. So in Detroit, a city with a violent crime rate four times that of Seattle, Wayne County College in Michigan trains paramedics without the use of animals. In Los Angeles, there are two prominent paramedic programs, one of them run by UCLA. Neither of those use animals to teach paramedics. In Baltimore, a city with a violent crime rate three times that of Seattle, paramedics are trained by the University of Maryland Baltimore County without animals. And University of Maryland Baltimore County is a neighbor of mine. I live in Washington, D.C. And so I emailed and called up the director back in the spring when we were working on a report on this issue. And here's what he sent me. He said that we have not participated in any live animal training in my 26 year tenure, UMBC does not support live animal training. He actually gave us permission to use this quote in a report we issued because he was so surprised that UW was still using animals. UMBC is a highly rated paramedic training program at the same level as UW, and yet, clearly, for 26 years, it's been turning out great paramedics without animals. And what is UW using animals for? Specifically, it's a single procedure called surgical airway. And surgical airway is performed. It's a critical, but it's a very rare procedure. What you would do is if somebody has an obstructed airway or a compromised airway, you can't access their airway normally through intubation, through the mouth or through the nose, you might have to open their airway surgically. So you'd make some incisions in the, the skin of the neck, you'd expose what's called the cricothyroid membrane, you then make some incisions in that membrane, and then you put a plastic tube through it into the airway so the patient can breathe. It's a critical procedure, but it's a rare one. And it's the only part of UW's entire training program that uses animals. A training program that is 2,500 hours long from start to finish. And yet, the pig lab makes up just 30 seconds to several minutes of that entire training program. Keep this in mind as we go forward and we talk about what UW's arguments are for using animals. Because it's really hard to imagine that this small part, literally less than one one thousandth of one percent of the entire curriculum is what the entire outcome of training hinges on. Now, there are a lot of people who have made statements about the availability of alternatives and lots of programs using those alternatives. But you might be asking, well, what would they use if they weren't using animals? Let's take a look. This is Sim Man. He breathes, he blinks, he bleeds. You can actually hook him up to computers and he'll give you data feedback. He has realistic human skin and subcutaneous fat. The US military really likes Sim Man because you can drag him into the field to perform procedures in an immersive environment. But there are other devices. This is Trauma Man, actually made here in Seattle, about uh, 25 minutes south of here. And Trauma Man can be used to teach surgical airway as well. One of the great things about Trauma Man and Sim Man is that they have replaceable skin tissue. At UW, four to five trainees practice on every pick. That means only the first training gets a real chance to have a first cut experience. According to some reports, after the first trainee, they then staple the neck tissue back up and the next trainee performs the procedure. The only other way to do it would be to move farther down the neck so that you're not actually performing a surgical airway in the place you would on a human patient. But the great thing about Trauma Man and Sin Man is that once a trainee has cut into the skin, you just pull it off and you replace it. So everybody gets that first cut experience. And the availability of alternatives like this is probably why one of the military's training experts said this in 2014. This is Major Andrew Hall, and he said that we have entered into an age where artificial simulator models are at least equivalent to, if not to superior to, animal models. 
Now, Dr. Hall said this after years of comparing animals, specifically pigs, to simulators to teach Air Force medics. He didn't come to this decision lightly. If you'd asked him two years before this, he would have said, the jury's still out. But in 2014, this is the statement he made. And there are other experts who have done studies on this. This was a 2015 Canadian Armed Forces study in which pigs and simulators were compared for specific surgical procedures. And it found uh, no difference in performance between medics trained on simulators versus live tissue models. But there was one important difference because they actually found that medics who were trained on surgical airway on simulators during the battlefield <coughs> scenario were more likely to pass the assessment because they were more likely to be able to insert the tracheotomy tube, that's the tube I was talking about earlier, into the trachea compared with those medics tested on the animal model. That's an important difference. It suggests that you can perform a surgical airway better if you're trained on simulators. The great news for UW is that they don't need to look to Canada or to Major Hall in the Air Force to find experts who think this way. Because this is Dr. Robert Sweet. He's the executive director of UW's Medical Simulation Center. And Dr. Sweet is a nationally renowned expert in comparative studies of animals and alternatives for teaching emergency procedures. He received a multi-million dollar grant from the US Army to study this very issue. And in 2015, he reported to the Society of Academic Emergency Medicine on a study in which more than 500 Army medics were trained using pigs and some using simulators. And what he found was no significant difference between live animals and simulator when measuring critical failures. Critical failures here are defined as when a provider, when a trainer needs to intervene with a trainee. No significant difference is what Dr. Sweet found. Now, what are UW's arguments? Why, considering everything we've just talked about, are they still using animals? And I, I want to give them a fair shake, so I quoted them verbatim from many documents that have been issued on this. The first one suggests that relatively few places teaching these techniques have the ability to support using the animal model. Therefore, the numbers of institutions not using the animal model is skewed in that direction. This is the we are lucky to have animals argument. We used to hear this from medical schools that would say, well, yeah, nobody else is doing it because they can't. They don't have the facilities. We're lucky <coughs> to offer this to our students. And this is what UW is saying. It's a hard thing to swallow when there are literally thousands of federal research facilities licensed by the US Department of Agriculture for the use of animals in laboratories. Now, lots of those places are not using animals for paramedic training. They're using animals for other purposes. But remember UCLA. I gave you that example earlier. The University of California, Los Angeles is one of the largest animal research facilities in the country. If UCLA's paramedic program wanted to use animals, pigs, dogs, whatever, certainly the, the university could allow it. But what they've decided instead at UCLA is that we don't need to use animals. In fact, we probably shouldn't. And so they've foregone it, and they teach paramedics without using animals. This doesn't really hold water. I, I don't quite understand where they're coming from. But this is one of the main arguments UW has put forth. Let's go on to the next one. Managing the real stress of interacting respectfully, we'll put the word respectfully aside for a different discussion, with a living creature is critical, uh, critical to the success of the procedure. Now, the argument here is that if paramedics are performing a procedure in a stressful environment, certainly they do, they should be trained in a stressful environment. And again, the jury is still out on whether or not Teaching under stress is a good idea. There's a lot of academics who actually disagree with that. But let's assume for a second that that is true, that training under stress is a good way to help prepare for the real stress of real world performance. If that's the case, then let's look at some studies regarding non-animal models. There are a number of them. I'm just going to give you two examples. This is the first one. This involved emergency medicine residents. And what they did is actually create an artificial emergency scenario using a simulator, like SimMan. And what they found was that physiological arousal suggests that the trainees, in this case residents, developed a sense of urgency and responsibility for managing the simulated patient. We were able to demonstrate the residents adequately suspended disbelief and performed as if it were real. Suspended disbelief is the operative phrase there. It's one that's used a lot in this literature. In case it's not clear, what that means is that they forget it's not real and they act and work as if it were. This can be done with animals. You can forget that the animal isn't going to survive the procedure, isn't a human patient. It can be done with stimulators. 
All it takes is some really good educators, and certainly UW could do the same thing here. The next study I want to show you involved medical students. They created an artificial cardiac arrest scenario, and they measured saliva of the trainees throughout the study. And what they found was that simulated emergency situation is a strong stressor with profound endocrine and psychological effects. The re reason they know about this, the endocrine effects is because in that saliva, they found high levels of cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And numerous studies, not just these two, but others, show that when you put trainees into that immersive scenario, like you could do at the University of Washington's state-of-the-art simulation center, they act as if it weren't real, they get stressed out, you can manipulate the scenario any way you want. So the idea that using live pigs is the only way to create a stressful environment just doesn't fly. But let's go on to the argument that is the most ridiculous, the one that comes up the most often, and the one that UW seems to be standing on a lot. And it's a little complicated, so let me talk about the heart a little. It involves cardiac arrest with ventricular fibrillation. So you see a map of the heart, a very rudimentary one. The lower chambers of the heart are the ventricles. If those ventricles start to quiver, it makes it hard for the heart to pump blood, maybe even impossible for the heart to pump blood to the rest of the body that causes cardiac arrest. This is important because here's what UW says. They say the survival of patients who suffer a witnessed collapse with ventricular fibrillation has increased from 20% in the 1970s to a peak of 62% in 2014, compared to the national average of 16%. Multiple reasons exist for this, including a unique training model. This was in a document that was given to the Board of Regents by the University of Washington's paramedic program. Now, I've talked to some physicians, and they have to say that 62% sounds astronomically high. If it is true, it is really impressive. But you might be wondering, what does cardiac arrest have to do with surgical airway? And the answer is pretty much nothing. Because we talk to trauma experts, we talk to paramedics who have been in the field for years, sometimes decades, and almost none of them can think of a single case of cardiac arrest in which the patient needed a surgical airway. The correlation is almost unheard of. This is an absolute red herring that UW puts forth. It's a real misleading statement, and I, I'm not sure why they're allowed to get away with it. So with all of this in mind, why does UW continue to use animals to teach paramedics? Anybody? Okay, I didn't think so. I don't know either. And a couple years ago, when we first learned about this, we wrote to the paramedic faculty here. And we then went to the leadership of the school. And we were getting crickets getting the cold shoulder. And so we went to media. And there's been some pretty extensive coverage on this over the last couple of years. And some of this coverage has actually come from a petition that Cindy Coker started. Cindy is a paramedic in Washington about an hour from here. And she's been practicing paramedicine for 30 years. She was so upset about what UW's, how UW is teaching paramedics that she started a change.org petition asking Washington residents to contact the school. So far, more than 5,000 people in the state have signed it, and tens of thousands elsewhere have as well. But media coverage and a change.org petition are good starts. We're going to need to do a little more to really change this. And that brings me to what you can do. The first thing I'd like you to do, and this is where you actually all get out your phones, because what I want you to do, if you haven't already, is sign that petition. This is the shortened URL. I made it really easy using a Google URL shortener. You can type this out on your phone, you can write it down on a piece of paper, but sometime this evening, whether now or later, you don't need to listen to me for the next few minutes, you can actually go do this. <laughs> but at some point, I really want you to sign that petition, and then I really want you to also share it on Twitter and Facebook and have other people in Washington State do the same. There have been so many people who signed this that a reporter actually found it and went to paramedic Cindy Coker and said, wow, I can't believe how many people are on board with this, and she did a story on King 5 recently, a TV news story a few weeks ago. So these things do have an effect, both on UW and on generating even more media coverage. The next thing I'd love you to do, if you're not doing it already, is to get more involved on campus with CARE, because they're a great group who are doing a lot of fantastic things, and they're highly organized. If you're a student, a faculty member, or just a member of the community, you can work with them to help spread the word on campus. But lastly, I want you to work with me. There is a sign-in sheet somewhere around here. And it asks you, okay, it's back there. Uh, 
It asks for your name, an email address, and your street address. I really need your street address, and I'm going to use that information responsibly, I promise. But what I really want to do is work with you to reach out to your state legislators and your county council members. <coughs> the reason the county council is so important is that UW actually has a contract with King County EMS for the training of King County paramedics. What we'd love to do is to change the parameters of that contract and require that UW not use animals. It's the only contract that exists between King County and any paramedic training program, so there's a real opportunity there for us to change things. But I can't figure out who your state legislator is and your county council, county council member if I don't have your address, so I really need that. Uh, I'm not gonna like throw it up on the web, we're not gonna throw it into our membership database, we just, I just wanna be able to work with you. So if you're interested in doing this, please give it to me, and if you wanna talk more, stick around. And together, we're gonna work on this, and I think sooner rather than later, we're going to end this animal lab as we've ended animal labs at dozens of other facilities. Thank you so much.